Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to Software Engineering. As always, I'm Bart Massey. As always, I sincerely hope you're staying safe and doing well out there in this very, very difficult time. Today, I want to talk to you about software and security, software engineering and security. It's a topic that has gotten a lot of attention over the last 10 or 20 years because as we've become increasingly interconnected and computers have gotten to be an increasingly large part of our daily lives and of our businesses and of everything, it's become super important that bad actors exist and we need to think carefully about what we can do about that. So as I dive in here today, I'm gonna to start with a little bit of a rant, which isn't my normal custom, but I think it's fair. You know, the, the premise of the book, there's a chapter here of some 40 pages. There's you know, a discussion in that chapter of all the ways you can do secure software development. And I'm here to give you maybe an hour of talk about how you can do secure software development, and it's super exciting. Look, for probably everyone watching this, you're not an experienced software engineer. You're not a security specialist. You can't make your software secure. That's asking a ridiculous amount of you. And nothing I can say in a short lecture, nothing the book can say in a short chapter is going to change that. So we've got to start with sort of realistic goals here, which is to understand some things about software security that are really important ideas. And the first important idea is that there's no such thing as secure code. Code is only secure in as much as it's part of a larger system that is secure. So if you're being asked to make your software secure, it's a, an unreasonable task to begin with because it's not clear what that means, except in the context of some broader system which also has to be secured. And whoever is thinking about security and planning for security has to have that larger plan. And the, the problem here is that at the end of the day, this idea that somehow we should blame on the developers, and especially on the low-level developers, failings in security is kind of not a fair or reasonable concept. It's an attempt by the industry. It's an attempt by educators to push off on you problems that are not really ultimately your fault. So let's be, having said that, having ranted, been realistic for a moment, no, really, how can I make my code secure? Okay, so when people talk about security, it's typically first and foremost about having the behavior of your software be correct. And to the extent that your software does what it was specified to do, then it becomes one of two things if there's a security problem a problem of the design of the larger security of the security of the system the larger system of which the software is a part or it becomes bad specifications and bad design of the software and yes you're being asked to produce specifications and do design but i strongly strongly encourage you and i'll talk about this a lot here in a little bit to rely on others who are expert in security to do those parts of specification design for you and not try to go there. And all this sounds kind of condescending. I know that's true. But I've been in this business for 40 years, since before I was an adult, and have built a lot of systems that need to have security questions and need to be facing users in a situation where there could be security issues. And I don't try to do my own security any more than I can avoid. I try as hard as I can to have other people who are security experts help me and advise me and tell me what to do. And that's maybe the most important thing. So, you know, the important idea here is that when you have a defect, it doesn't just mean that your code won't necessarily do what you want, won't behave the way you want it. It also means that an adversary can figure out how to take advantage of those unwanted behaviors. It is much, much harder to attack a system, not impossible, but much, much harder to attack a system if the code is behaving entirely as intended. Um, and that assumes you have sufficient intent. You need to have that too. 
And let me just put a shout out here for how bad C and C++ are as programming languages for anything that needs to be secure. We've known for really 30, 40 years that of all the languages that are wide, in widespread use in programming today, they're arguably the worst languages in terms of giving you lots of room, lots of capacity to hurt yourself by making it easy to make mistakes that don't actually turn into, you know, and make defects that don't actually turn into failures right away. So you have hidden bugs in your system that's very easy to do in C++, where only under certain circumstances will your system misbehave. And it's very easy to make very common kinds of cognitive mistakes in C and C++ that you're punished for with incorrect code. And so, you know, that, That'd be, if I had one piece of advice to improve your security situation, it would be quit using C and C++. So there we are. Um, so what is security? What are we even talking about here? Well, we talked last about reliability, and in reliability, we're worried about making mistakes and having nature punish us, right? Having accidents punish us. Here, we're talking about somebody who's presumably at least as smart as you and at least as knowledgeable as you deliberately trying to take advantage of your mistakes for some hostile reason. And that is challenging because it's hard enough to get a program of even a few hundred lines reasonably secure against accidents. Getting it reasonably secure against attacks may be more than we can do. Uh, it certainly is very expensive and very difficult to make something seriously security resistant. And so far, the software industry's history, to continue my rant, has been a series of half measures and kludges and something called defense in depth, where we do a bunch of measures badly. Uh, the end result is that security threats are hard. And, you know, first, it requires changing a bunch of assumptions about what it is that you need to think about, about what it is that you need to do. Your, your analysis of your software and how it should work and what it should do becomes much more sophisticated all of a sudden as you start to think about what the other side might be thinking. And the key idea here is that, it's to model threats. It's to say, well, what can I reasonably expect that an adversary would do and how likely is it and how bad is it? So that's the key ideas in threat modeling is you think, well, what might the bad guys do in my situation? What might they try to do to my software or to my system? And you'd like to know a couple things, really. First of all, how likely are they to do it? And second of all, how likely is it to work? That would be good to know, right? Is this a threat that I really think is likely or is it a threat that I think is extremely unlikely? And like I say, that may be because it's very difficult, right? Maybe I didn't use a long enough password and there's some small chance somebody will guess my password, that's unlikely, maybe. You know, I used a very short password, but in a system with military grade surveillance and the consequences of the attacker, if they get caught trying to guess my password are really high, you know, then it's still maybe unlikely they'll try to guess even my dumb password. So we have to figure out likelihood. We also want to figure out severity. What are the consequences? If they do do the thing they're trying to do as an attack and it does succeed, how bad is it? And the only reason we even consider very unlikely attacks is when we find that they're very unlikely attacks that would have very, very high consequences if they were pulled off. Both of these things are hard. Estimating these things and doing this kind of threat modeling is super hard. And as a consequence, people tend not to do it at all, or if they do do it, they do it very casually. And so you're already in trouble. What you're really trying to do is build a risk analysis, which is a thing you should be doing anyway for software and that we should talk about at some point, which is to say, well, take the product of likelihood and cost, that is, what's the likelihood, multiply that by the cost, to get the risk of that particular attack or the risk really of anything that might happen. 
And what we want to do is reduce our total risk, the sum over all these individual risks, attacks or whatever. We want to reduce it as much as possible. And the typical way to do that is to order the threats from worst, highest risk to lowest and start trying to get rid of high risk threats, trying to find some way to reduce their likelihood or reduce their severity so that and we do that enough so that the total risk we end up with is reasonable. So that's the kind of thing you do in a threat modeling exercise if you're worried about attackers. It's also the kind of thing you do in a risk modeling exercise if you're just worried about reliability. And there are very few things we do in our lives as engineers that wouldn't benefit from a solid risk analysis. It's really a highly encouraged activity even though software engineers don't spend very much time doing it. So the problem, of course, if you're not a security person, is how do you possibly imagine what attackers might do? It's a hard question in general anyway. Attackers are incredibly creative people in general. You have to assume that. And so trying to imagine what attacks they might generate is very hard. But at the very least, we might think about the things that have been done commonly in the past as attacks. One of the interesting things about software security is that things that have worked for 40 years to attack systems seem to continue to work, which tells you how dire the situation is. And so we should at least find out about those and model them. So the book divides things up into several categories. Uh, integrity access and availability threats essentially and that's as good a model as any so what's an integrity threat well that's a situation where the adversary is actually trying to damage the system make it fail uh you can imagine for example that if i could make someone's pacemaker fail and the pacemakers are all now full of software tons and tons of it and they all talk by interesting interfaces to the outside world so the pacemakers can be adjusted if i could make your pacemaker fail that's a pretty big consequence and so i need to think about it right i can make your businesses systems fail by sending a worm or virus around a bigger threat typically and a threat that's sort of it's hard to break these up is access threats the adversary gets access to or control of a system that they're not supposed to have access to or not supposed to have control of. So for example, they might um, capture passwords from somewhere and use those passwords to get into a system. They might bypass a security mechanism by taking advantage of bugs in code. And once they control the system, they can damage it if they want to. They can do sort of whatever they want with it. They can uh, extract information they want. They can make the system misbehave in ways that, you know, are to their advantage. And so that's the main class of threats we're worried about. Uh, you know, if the attacker isn't able to get access to your system, they often can still externally keep anybody else from using the system either. This is where we get what's called denial of service, DOS attacks. Uh, the most famous kind are using the internet to do what's called a distributed denial of service or DDoS attack. And in a DDoS attack, we have people bombarding the system's network connection with packets, hopefully designed to be as impactful as possible with the idea that, yeah, this won't get you access to the system it won't really damage the system itself but it will keep everybody from getting in and this has actually been historically a very uh, common blackmail technique against large companies who are making a lot of money is to organize a ddos and run it until the company pays up to make it go away but anytime you go to overwhelm system capacity it doesn't necessarily take the internet at all you can overwhelm the capacity of a system by giving it too big a request or whatever and make the system unavailable to others and that's a thing. I'm going to take a little bit of an aside here for a second and talk about one of my pet things that I always try to talk about whenever I get an excuse which is the glory and joy of backups as they exist in modern computer systems. We are in a unique position among all kinds of engineering in so many ways. And one of those ways is if we've done it right, we're literally only a button press from the best place we've ever been in our project. 
And backups are security relevant in as much as when a system and attackers gain control of the system, typically your only reasonable thing to do is to sort of go back in time to a point at which the attacker didn't have control of the system as far as you can tell and start forward again from there. And if you don't do that, if you fail to uh, back up in time, this, the, an attacker with total control over your system can leave so much stuff behind that it's impossible to ever trust that system again. So this is a key mechanism, having good backups. And you've got to think carefully about the fact that the backups themselves are also vulnerable to reliability and security issues. I heard a long, apparently true urban legend a long time ago about a company here in Portland who darn near lost their entire business because a sysadmin corrupted their machine and also corrupted their on their on-site backups and the only backups left were off-site backups that the sysadmin was using for blackmail um, basically give me some money or I will destroy the only copy of the software that's your entire business so that's the kind of thing that you have to think about a little bit is it's not just that you definitely want your backups to be fully automated there should be no need for human inventor intervention to make sure the backups happen regularly um, something that's not on here, I think, for some reason, but should be, is it's not enough to back up part of your stuff. You should literally back up everything that could conceivably be of value automatically. Uh, I've seen several incidents in my career where people had backups. They were good automated backups, and yet the thing that was supposed to be on there, eh, that hadn't been in an important place, you know, and so it wasn't actually included in the backups, and companies lost a lot. If, if in doubt, back it up. You need to keep, keep at least one set of backups off-site. My general rule of thumb for data is there's at least three copies. There's the, co the live copy, the local backup copy, and an offsite backup copy of some kind because houses burn down, people get burgled. A friend of mine lost everything they ever computed pretty much when the burglars came in and stole everything, including not just their computer, but their on site backups. Uh, that was the point that convinced me that off site backups were important. You need to be doing it. And a backup's only as good as its recovery. Many are the horror stories in the industry of people who had very good backups, but have never really checked to see if they're working properly and when you go to get them. We almost lost x.org at one point because of a failure of this kind where we thought stuff was being backed up. Everybody thought stuff was being backed up and it wasn't. And when a failure happened and we needed the backups, they weren't really available. Um, so you gotta do this. I. I have zero tolerance for people in industry, people in my courses saying, well, I lost my stuff, it's gone, because it's just too easy and cheap to back stuff up. Um, you know, with storage at dollars per gigabyte at most. Um, really, it's 10 cents a gigabyte these days. Um, yeah, you should be able to back up your stuff. So a, 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 a common class of bugs that lead to problems have to do with what's called authorization and authentication, which is the part where your system has to interact with humans and the humans need interactions need to be restricted in some way. And so there's sort of two parts to that. The authorization part is who is this? How does the system know who it's talking to? And the authentication part is uh, Sorry, the other way around. Authentication is who is this? What do I, uh, you know, how do I know who I'm talking to? And authorization is what is this allowed to do? And this may be a person, this may also be a role. And oftentimes roles are better than people to use as an authentication, as an authorization mechanism. And so you not, not only need to authenticate yourself, you need to manage what roles are associated with you. All of this is rolled up into something called user account management which is its whole own thing and is incredibly difficult. And then there are access control mechanisms. And this is a classic example of don't design and build your own. 
there's all kinds of principles, blah, blah, for, you know, how to build password systems and how to avoid passwords and hardware dongles and blah, blah, blah. The bottom line is that if I'm building a system today that wants to be internet facing, for example, I'm going to leverage Google's uh, OAuth authentication. I'm going to have Google accounts be the authentication mechanism because Google has a bunch of trained brilliant people who spent their lives trying to make that UAM system be a solid, reliable UAM system. I don't want to try to duplicate that. I don't think I can. And so using somebody else's always the best thing. As far as access control, there again, you know, my Linux operating system provides some access control who can get what file and that sort of thing. Uh, the database that I'm using probably provides some access control if it's a multi-user database about who can get access to what tables and how. Let those things help you. Don't try to build your own mechanisms any more than you can and do the simplest possible thing that'll work. But the big deal here is if you're building a system like this, a, build a, a system that's user-facing and there's some issues with authorization and access control, uh, you really, really need to find somebody who's very expert at those issues and have them review your work. This is the kind of thing where working by yourself is almost always a failure. Typically the best work's done by teams, but at the very least somebody who's expert and has a ton of experience needs to look over what you've done and make sure that it's okay because they will know a bunch of things that commonly happen that you will never have heard of or thought about. Cryptography, um, the, the cryptographers all say the exact same thing, and I include in cryptography sort of communications protocols. Secure communications, including cryptographic communications, secure files, including crypt encrypted files, etc. Look, this is a black art. This is 10 years of study to even become considered competent in the area, and you have to be brilliant as well. You absolutely need this stuff. It's absolutely a linchpin of computer security, but I have only known ever three or four people in my entire life who are good enough to actually do this kind of work. You use existing ones and use them as carefully as you can. TLS, formerly SSL, you know, has solved a ton of security problems. It's fantastic. And uh, you should be using it to protect transactions to protect uh, protocol interactions that happen are happening any place public and you should get there again somebody to review all that but you certainly shouldn't invent your own anything at this point because it's just too hard so get expert help that's what this is about it's certainly true that one of the most common classes of bugs in software systems is the class of insufficient checking of inputs and that that's not only a reliability bug it's also potentially a security bug uh, there again this is made way worse by C C++ which make it very hard to do reasonable things with strings um, and uh, therefore really encourage all kinds of errors in uh, input checking but you know little bobby tables is a thing if you if you got a database the book gives an example of a sql attack that will um get you stuff or trouble and you need to worry about that kind of stuff and be really really careful that you're checking data um you know c is like i say famous for buffer overflows where somebody just types a too long string and it right overwrites your memory and uh, you've got a real problem because your memory's been overwritten. And I can't think of any other modern language than C, C++ that really is that vulnerable to buffer overflows. They just don't happen in other languages, either because they're garbage collected or because, like Rust, they're carefully checked at compile time. So, yeah, check your, check your inputs. Um, any time you, you know your software is broken if it's anything large or reasonable you know there are defects that, you, that have gotten in there 
you know, even if it gets to a few hundred lines, you know there's already defects in your code because that's how software works. And given that it's almost impossible to eliminate all those defects, all those bugs, you gotta be concerned that if your adversary is clever, they will find uh, those bugs and those exploits of those bugs can reach really, really far, can do way more than you think would be possible just glancing at it naively. And so it's super important for you to test and verify your software as best you can to validate, verify, and inspect um, your software, make it as solid as you can, because that's the one thing that you can effectively do even at this level and it's hard it's hard hard work but the thing is that most of the time in the wild if you find a crash or you find a bug that produces wrong answers you'd be surprised how often that turns into a CVE into a security report at the national level because bugs tend to be exploitable um, make your software do the right thing the other thing is, of course, you know, software is used by people, and people make mistakes. Uh, it's very easy, typically, to talk people into giving you passwords, to talk people into performing operations on the on your on their system that are not in their best interests. That kind of stuff is pretty straightforward. The one that nobody ever talks about for whatever reason, to the point where I don't even have good statistics on how much it happens in industry, is we know bribery is cheaper than you think in terms of inducing people to do things against their company's interest. We know that blackmail is a real thing in the real world and people can be coerced to do stuff that's against their company's best interests and their own. And so if you design your system so that as long as the users behave perfectly, everything's fine, that's not worth much. You have to think about what might my, my users do maliciously, either because they themselves are malicious or because they're being influenced by malicious people, by adversaries. The, 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 the trick here is to get experience building larger scale software in less risky places. Don't start with medical device building that's that's high stakes stuff don't start in banks because that's high stakes stuff uh you know that's not places where new software developers are going to be very comfortable the even if you're all your thing is as well it's a thing that faces the web well there's all kinds of really scary risks associated with building software that runs on the web and you don't want to incur any of them so find some low risk systems and get some experience building those first open source is fantastic because with open source systems there's a ton of distributed responsibility for risks and security and you'll get a lot of eyeballs on your system and people will point out to when you've made security mistakes in those systems in a way that you just won't get in a lot of industry settings um in systems that are built for internal corporate use and are built for internal corporate, you know, by internal corporate people for internal use, typically that's a very, very friendly environment. There are still security risks, but a lot of them are less because of just how the systems are set up and built. And so that can be a low risk place to get started. Games, etc., typically not a huge amount of security exposure. And so that's another good place. But the point is, as you start to take your first gigs and think about where you want to work, you need to be thinking about what kind of situation am I putting myself into with respect to security? Because it can be really traumatic to have a security related problem that was your fault. Your fault in the sense that the system didn't allow you, that however the software was being built, didn't give you the support you needed to make it secure. And again, you know, this is always easy to say, but here it's seriously true. Anytime you smell a security issue of any kind, go talk to somebody who knows about security stuff and get their opinion and their input. Uh, mostly security problems are very 
susceptible to being corrected if a bunch of smart people are paying attention to them. They aren't impossible. It's just that there's so many of them that it's hard to pay attention to them all at once. So there's some things I know about security. Like I say, this discussion is really just a starting point, and I encourage you, if you're interested in this topic, to go ahead and take the classes you need to become more of a professional in this area. I'd encourage you to do more reading outside of the textbook and listen to more stuff than just my amateur lecture. And hopefully we can start to build systems that are a little bit more reliable, not just against mistakes, but against bad guys, because nobody wants bad guys to win. Take care, everybody. As always, thank you very much for listening. As always, do stay safe and well out there, and I hope to talk to you again very soon.